May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. In Luke 24, verse 36b through 48, our risen Savior appears to his disciples again. They believe they are seeing a ghost again, but he shows them flesh and bones. He offers them his hands and his feet for proofs that he is who he says that he is. He wants them to see his wounds. He doesn't want them to look in his eyes. He doesn't want them to listen to his voice. He wants them to look and see his hands and his feet. Look at my hands and my feet, he says. These hands, these hands were the ones that reached for his mother Mary and the major of Bethlehem and then reached for the stars where God and the angels shined holy light. These hands had played with the children of Egypt and then Nazareth and worked at his father's carpenter's bench. These hands had broken bread and shared cooked fish by the seaside, just as he was doing now, eating fish with them. These hands had pressed mud against a blind man's eyes and lifted Lazarus out of the tomb. These hands had danced in the air when he taught and reached out to lepers who others would push away. He drew them in. These hands pulled them when they needed to move forward and push them when they were troubled and couldn't step out to face their fears. These hands were hardworking, compassionate, loving, and just hands. And these feet, these feet had been his strong foundation throughout his life. These feet had carried him through the desert back from Egypt to Palestine as a boy, and then took him to the temple where at the feet of the rabbis, he taught them what the scripture meant. These feet had been his leverage while working with his father at the bench, his strength and guide when he descended into the muddy rivers of the Jordan River for baptism. These feet had carried him to prayer in the desert and into a face-off with the devil, into the fray of thousands of miles of places and tough situations which everybody else's feet walked away from. These feet moved him forward toward people who were starving for food and good news. These feet had taken him on walks of solitude and into crowds of need. These feet had taken him into homes of criminals and tax collectors, corrupt bureaucrats and synagogue leaders and dying children, each whom he treated like long lost friends. These were courageous, forward-moving, mission-focused, and justice-action feet. Both his hands and his feet bore new scars, healing from the crucifixion right now. The left hand, the right hand, the left foot, the right foot, all four of them broken and bruised and torn apart from the crucifying cross where he had hung just a few days before. And the risen Christ wants his disciples to look at a sight like they've never seen before, the hands and the feet of a crucified and risen Lord, because they'd never looked before and they had to look now. He wants them to see that in spite of all the brokenness of his hands and his feet, the danger has passed, and God has transformed this vicious death into a victory for life. The risen Christ has gone through the danger and not around it. His hands and his feet bear that truth. His broken, bruised, and torn hands and feet now reveal as witnesses the hope of the future. He wants his closest friends to look and see and to feel the truth. 
He needs them to be witnesses to the truth as well. After eating with them, after opening their eyes and hearts to the truth about the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, he commissions them. He tells them as a blessing, as a commission to bear witness to these things. You are witnesses of these things, he says. All they have seen with their eyes, their hands, their feet, their hearts, they must now receive and share with others what they are witnessing. Think of this. They have no iPhones. They have no devices. They have no computers. They have no televisions. There's no social media. I know it's really hard to imagine, isn't it? They have no social networking sites. There are no image sharing and message sharing sites. There's no video sharing sites. There's no social blogging. There's no podcasting. There's no social community and discussion groups online. They don't even have Yahoo Answers. But then again, we don't have Yahoo Answers anymore either. All they have is themselves as witnesses to these things. And now, here, on April 18th, 2021, we have to imagine in our mind's eye that all Jesus has are our eyes and our hands, are our feet and our heart as witnesses of these things. That's right. You and I are now the witnesses of all these things, the witnesses for Jesus Christ. It is essential that we see the hands and feet of our risen Savior. You and I need to step up and take a good, long look. Love requires us to look. Love requires us to use our hands and our feet after we look. Too many of us want to live in our heads or in a bubble of a world that we've created for our own protection. And we can create all sorts of worlds in our heads, some of them real and some of them so far gone that only we can know that. With our hands and with our feet, we can move from our heads into acts of compassion and action. As witnesses and in the power of the Holy Spirit, we can also move others with their hands and their feet. And I would love to simply spiritualize this message about hands and feet and go on to say what I want to say next. But I have to tell you, for us to be witnesses is what the whole Easter story is about. For us to be Easter people, we have to be witnesses. And we have to face the truth and speak the truth in love. You know, the, the word itself in the, in the Greek, in the New Testament, comes from a word that's the same as martyr. It's martyrous is the word. It, it means the one who literally lays down his life or her life for another. Somebody who will sacrifice. So it's not just what you see, it's how you act after you've seen. First, we witness many things, and it happens all the time. Now, some of us, for example, this week are over the moon because Jack David Schwartz was born to Corey Lynn and to Ben, and we have that rose to show it as a symbol, as our witness on his behalf. And we know just late yesterday that Emily and Scott have welcomed a new one, Cameron Elizabeth, into the world. There are many witnesses on this day. I'm one. My granddaughter's one today. Yesterday, many of us celebrated Buckeye's return with 20,000 fans spread out over 100,000 seats. It looked pretty sparse, but they were happy, and we were witnesses. And you kept texting me about it all afternoon. And also many of us were witnesses to the death and the yesterday's funeral and burial of Prince Philip, husband of Queen Elizabeth for 73 years. The world was watching the power of ritual, the remembrance of people across the globe and his family's farewell. And no one will ever forget the witness of the queen by herself in her mask alone to grieve her husband of 73 years. By the way, a powerful witness to anyone in COVID time who has lost a loved one and knows what that looks like and feels like. In the same week, we have been witnesses to one horrific incident 
and shooting after another. I have witnessed Dante Wright being shot and killed in Brooklyn Center, Minnesota on a car stop for an air freshener by a police officer. I have witnessed Miles Jackson being shot and killed by security guards and Columbus police in St. Anne's Hospital here in Westerville, Ohio. I have witnessed the videos now weeks old from Holy Week of 13-year-old Adam Toledo being shot and killed by a Chicago police officer on March 29th. All of these young men, and they were all young, were men of color, all killed by white police officers. We may not like to say that out loud, but it's a witness that we need to make. As one witness for justice had on a banner last night in a rally in downtown Columbus, Columbus is not safe for black people. Sadly, that banner could be found in every town and city in America this morning. And that's what witnesses witness to. Thursday night, I witnessed that a 19-year-old named Brandon Hall opened fire on workers at a FedEx site in Indianapolis, Indiana, and killed eight people, wounding five more. And four of those that were killed were from a very tight and small religious community, the Sikh community. Just last night in Columbus, I witnessed another shooting in which one person was killed and five were wounded by a drive-by murder as people were gathered to remember the one-year anniversary of another who lost his life on that site one year before at the Dollar General store. This is insane. Now, in the first 108 days of 2021, we have had 148 mass shootings. There are so many more stories this week of people being shot and killed and shot and wounded. Some of these shootings, like many of those I spoke of, have been police shooting citizens, but it continues unabated that in the midst of this time, people are killing each other. We are all witnesses to this, and witnesses take action. Laws need to change. Hearts and minds need to change. This needs to end now. All week, I've been witnessing the individual and collective trauma of our members and my friends and colleagues within the African-American community who once again have been traumatized and re-traumatized by the day in and day out violence and racial hatred that has been enacted against them for years, against their loved ones, against black and brown men, women, and children in our community and in the nation. And it's not just about guns and traffic stops. Witnesses need to look further. On Monday night, April, on Monday, April 12th, the Cleveland Plain Dealer published an op-ed that I wrote. It was entitled, we can and we must reduce black maternal mortality in Ohio now. The maternal mortality rate in the United States is the highest of any developed nation in the world, and it's rising. Black, brown, and indigenous women are two to three times more likely to die from pregnancy-related causes than white women. Between 2008 and 2016 in Ohio, there were 29.5 maternal deaths per 100,000 black mothers and 11.5 per 100,000 among white mothers. I point this out right now, any one of those deaths is too many deaths, but right now there are ways that we can get money to help this cause through the Recovery Act and opportunities in the state budget to fund medical care for pregnant women of color. We can turn this around now in Ohio. Witnesses take action and our state legislature can make this happen. But as I shared this article with black mothers in our congregation in the Columbus community, I was blown away this week as one after another told me or called me or texted me or emailed me horror stories about their birth experiences in central Ohio and, their mis and the mistreatment of their sisters and friends during pregnancy and delivery. It was as though my article simply revealed the tip of an iceberg and how bad it really is beyond death. There are so many who have simply faced difficulties they never should have met. 
Now I'm more determined than ever to see these laws pass and dollars received in care for women of color in their pregnancies and deliveries, and I want you to join me as a witness in this effort. When we are in relationship with others, when we see their hands and their feet, their wounds and their pains, their physical distress and their hunger and their needs, their mental distress, their trauma related to racism and sexism and homophobia and disabilities unattended and poorly served and simply growing from the effects of a pandemic, we know that we are called to be witnesses to these things. Now call me paranoid or call me prophetic. You probably will call me both, but I had a vision the other day. I was thinking about the long-term effects on survivors and first responders from 9-11, which is now 20 years past. It's hard to believe. As you know, the survivors from the Twin Towers and the women and men who attended to the dead and the cleanup at Ground Zero in the months and years that followed the destruction of the World Trade Center and the death of 2,606 people in New York City faced many physical and mental health challenges. Except for the valiant efforts of a few American citizens like John Stewart, one of my heroes, and others who refused to forget them, their health coverage would have been dropped and the long-term effects they faced would have not been dealt with. The witnesses to those things never gave up. Now here's where my vision came in. I thought of our frontline workers right now, who through 14 months of this pandemic, the men, the women, the children, who have cared for 566,000 and more unto death and nurtured millions back to health. I thought of them behind the scenes who've daily put themselves out on the line for our nation in need. And all of the sudden, I had this weird feeling that outside of taking care of themselves in a, in a year or a few years or 10 years, the rest of us would have forgotten all that they did for us. That they had become a distant memory, that all our signs, our horn honking, our hand clapping, our cheering had passed away, and then they found themselves alone. And they found themselves taking this all on by themselves, and this long nightmare of constant care that they'd given and given and given just wasn't cared for anymore. And I thought to myself, God, help us not to let this happen to them. Let us be for them witnesses, as they have been for us, our saviors in this time of crisis. Likewise, who will be there for the victims of shootings when the guns stop firing? Who will be there to care for the families and their children and their children's children? Who will listen? Who will be present to hear the stories of facing constant gunfire in their neighborhoods and streets? Who will hold them in their grief and defend them in their trials? Who will be there to counter and fight racism in all of its microaggressive forms as well as macroaggressive forms? Who will be witnesses of these things? Is it enough to witness the love of Jesus in your heart? I think Jesus would say, it's not enough. And that's why he took time with the disciples to show them his hands and his feet, to show them what pain looks like, and knew that by doing this, he would live out his purpose of leading them to care for others forever. When you see the risen Christ's hands and feet, I want you to see the hands and feet of our beloved community who are wounded in pain, traumatized by hate, and in constant barrage of assaults on their humanity. The words of Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel come to mind as I close. He once wrote, some are guilty, but all are responsible. We may not be guilty of any crimes and we may not have wronged any one person or any one group, but we are all witnesses of these things and that makes us responsible. We are all responsible. As followers of Jesus Christ, we're all in this. We're all being called to spread good news and to be good news. We are all witnesses of these things. 
May we also be change agents of these things in the name of the risen Christ. Amen.